We are thrilled to have this standing room only group. Thank you so much for coming from all over the place. Uh, we are going to have the live, we're going to be live on Facebook, so any of you want to turn around and face the camera and wave in case, there we go, I'm on, there you go, folks watching all over the world, in fact, a lot of you are here from all over the world, thanks so much for coming. Uh, Mr. McCammon is going to chat about his life, his works, and a very special surprise just for you guys, and then at 3.30, we're going to have a drawing for all of you and all the folks, as we mentioned, around the world. For <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> well, this incredible magic walking stick, somebody is going to walk away with the walking stick or we'll mail it to wherever. Uh, and that's at 3.30. I hate 30. just... <laughs> but between now and 3.30, here's Robin McCammon. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Oh, well, listen, thanks, thanks everybody for being here on this nice summer afternoon. I really appreciate it. Uh, also, um, We'll be joined here in just a little bit by my very good friend, Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, also uh, Paul McCartney and uh, Abraham Lincoln. I do get it. Because, you know, I do. I do. But thank you all for being here. You know, you repeated all over the world uh, a couple of times. Like, really, all over the world? We're doing this all over the world? Oh, my God. Poor world. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. You know, I do get confused and, 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 uh, about some things, but I do not get confused about the Matthew Corbett series. I've enjoyed doing this so much, and I appreciate your readership. I appreciate you hanging in with me uh, over, well, soon, now nine volumes, soon to be ten. And, um, you know, I, I felt like I, I know these people so well, I know the wor this world so well, that it's going to be hard to say goodbye to it but I will be saying goodbye to it uh, with the last book, Leviathan. Uh, which is why I wanted to go ahead and do the short story book. Uh, as I wrote on my website, you know, it's really kind of now or never for the, for the shorter pieces because after I finish Leviathan, I, I, won't, uh, I won't return to Matthew. Though Matthew will in some way go on and on and on, I do think. Um, but you know, doing this series, it's almost like I'm not, you know, I'm not really writing these things. I'm just translating them from one era to another. Uh, I, I'm like communicating. I'm communicating something that speaks to me, and I, you know, I feel so strongly about the characters in this world. They're really, really, truly alive. That it's just um, it's so energetic. But you know, I've had a little difficulty beginning Leviathan. And um, I'm well into it now, but I had some difficulty starting it because, well, two reasons. Because, again, it's the last of the series, and I felt like, you know, well, I'm losing some friends now, and this is the last time I'll ever start a Matthew Corbin book. Also because it, has, it opens with probably the most violent, gruesome scene I've ever written, and certainly in the series. And it took me a little while to get to grips with that because it has it, it's necessary for the story and had to be done. But it is an extremely violent and gruesome scene that uh, I had to come to grips with. And I remember <clears throat> a few years ago, I was doing a reading of Mr. Slaughter at the uh, Birmingham Library. And I was reading the, with some other authors too. But I was reading the portion from Mr. Slaughter where he uh, kills the family in the farmhouse. And several people I could tell were really visibly disturbed by this and they got up and they walked out. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but, should I be proud of that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> But you know, it, and, and I'm sure that if I was to read uh, this upcoming beginning scene from Leviathan, those probably same people would get up and walk out again. But 
you know, you can't talk about evil without putting it on display. You really have to show it. Uh, you can't, well, this person is bad, he does this, that, and the other. You really got to show it. And, you know, Gardner Lillehorn, Lillehorn told Matthew uh, in one of the books, there's, be careful because there's far worse out there than Professor Fell. And in Leviathan, Matthew finds the far worse than Professor Fell. And so you got to, you got to do this thing. So, uh, again, um, Leviathan. Well into that, excited about it, a lot to do. It's going to be a big book because, you know, there's a lot to cover, a lot to take care of. And I've had the, I've had the ending of Leviathan for many, many years. Um, and I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, I think it's pretty good. It, it's a little out of character for the rest of the series. But anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. So I'm very excited about that. Um, okay. Um, Seven Shades of Evil. Very excited to do these short stories. Uh, and, and, and again, as I wrote on the website, actually there are eight stories in it because I got to the end and I thought, you know, again, it's like, well, am I the writer of these or am I the conveyor of, of just the information? I don't know. But it's like I got to the end and I thought, well, I'm leaving out a, a very important character. And that character is Barry Grigsby. So I thought, I need to do a story about Barry. And so there are eight stories in the seven <laughs> chapters. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Now, um, any questions so far? Anybody have any questions? And we'll get to that later, I guess. Um, I thought, well, you know, I always like to do readings. I, I really enjoy reading. And I thought, well, I'm going to read something from Seven Shades of Evil. But I couldn't find anything that I thought well stood alone to read in a short space. So I've written a new story. Oh. And <laughs> well, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> I like it when it goes up, not down. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. So this is a it's a, it's a, very, a fairly short story, and it's called Robber's Roost. Uh, so anyway, I did this. Uh, it came to me. This information was conveyed to me a few days ago. So I hope you like this. <clears throat> Have another go, dearie? The nearly besotted young man seemed barely able to lift his head on his flimsy neck after the two tankards of briny tasting ale. Pardon, he managed to get out between liquor bruised lips. Another taste, lovey. Can't leave here without another taste, can we? We, the young man thought, though his brain was also numbed, it was this blousy enchantress fooling. There would be no we in the direction he was headed. But the dice had been thrown, and the answer must be surely. I mean, surely not. What exactly was he trying to say? The communication jinxed between mind and mouth. I'll have another, he amended. Chancy, <coughs> roared the Terran angel in a voice that could singe the hairs on a goat's rump. A third tankard for the young gentleman. In accordance with the demand, the hulking black-bearded mass behind the bar began to draw a third tankard from a green-veined keg. Seems like we should get to know one another a bit better, said the lady of the house, who leaned in closer at the table and gave a pat to one of the young men's thighs. I told you my name is Honeybell. You ain't given up yours yet. The young man shrugged. What's in a name? His voice is becoming more slurred by the moment. His sense is more fogged, and dangerously so. Well, how's about letting on what your business is? Seems you're a real worthy gentleman, if you get my meaning. Worthy, he asked. Do you mean wealthy? Oh, yes, dearie, she answered, as she took the chariot aside and took also his left hand, as the right was reserved for lifting tankards. That's just what I mean. The young man rubbed his grizzled jaw three days unshaven and pondered his response. He could smell himself as his last bath had likewise been several days before. Or was that the lady? Though he was dressed in the finery of an expensive dark blue suit, a pale blue waistcoat, and a white cravat adorned with a small ruby stick pin, he was dusty from the late October road 
and he had come many miles indeed to this rustic, nasty hole, rather calling itself a tavern, titled The Traveler's Rest. Wealthy, he repeated. Mm, yes, I suppose I am. Of course you am, said Honeybell, whose odiferous aroma was far from the hive, and whose grind wheel of a voice, if a bell might serve to wake the dead from their graveyard beds. <laughs> have to be wealthy to be carrying that bag of coins. Chancy, she bellowed over her shoulder. Come on with that AR, gent's got a thirst. I am in the business of breeding horses, slurred the honored guest. Rather, it's my father's business, but he has put much faith in me to travel to Philadelphia on his behalf. And you're journeying alone? My, my, not even a coach and a driver. This brought forth a bemused smile, though it hung crooked on the lip. My father has not made his great fortune by spending money needlessly on what he terms uh, frib, uh, frib, uh, uh, wasteful things, <laughs> such as a coach and driver or passage on a packet boat. Therefore, I am on my own. But hark, I can nearly hear New York town's industry from here. And my business in Philadelphia was quite successful indeed. Glad to hear it, but you know New York town's at least 20 miles further up the pike. Now, if you like you might spend the night here in a fine, cozy room and it, as it's getting quite chilly out there now that the sun's a goner. Mr. Corbett was the reply to her pause. Matthew Corbett. Matthew, she repeated, and her thin-lipped mouth showed a black-toothed grin. I do like that. <laughs> the age of this person was difficult for Matthew to determine due to the heavy white makeup and blast of red rouge on her face. She might be an elder woman fairly maintained or a younger one gone to blazes. Her thick ringlets of hair were as black as a devil's mercy, and her blue eyes gleamed from pockets of what appeared to be silver paint. Her breasts swelled against her bodice like huge white waves about to swamp ships in Manhattan Harbor, and her gown, <laughs> what there was of it, was the indistinct gray color of well-worn age. All in all, Honey Bell was quite a picture, but surely not the one she'd intended to convey. Behind the bar, the bearded Chansey was totally silent, except for a curt nod at the woman's instruction. There had been two other men in the place a while ago. They'd had a tankard apiece and played a few hands of cards, and they'd left. But as Chansey lumbered over and set the third tankard of ale on the stained table before the young guest, Matthew's attention had returned to another figure sitting over on the far side, past a hearth where wet wood sizzled and popped and produced more sour-smelling smoke than heat or fire. This object of his interest was a slim, beak-nosed man who'd been nursing a drink for the past hour and wore a straw hat, a deerskin jacket, brown breeches, and beneath the jacket, a lavender-hued waistcoat adorned with silver buttons. He seemed to be looking everywhere except at Matthew, though Matthew knew the man was looking directly at him most of the time. Drink up, dearie, said Honey Bell, lifting the tanker toward his mouth. Matthew caught the hand and lowered it. God help him, the two previous ales had set his head reeling well enough, and he had to play this straight. No need to be hasty, is there? I've got plenty of time, and as you say, the chill night is not fit for traveling. Right enough, was her energetic answer. Get yourself a room upstairs. <coughs> head off to New York town bright and early. Matthew nodded. He stirred the ale with her forefinger. Hmm, he said idly. Is it speaking to himself? This liquid seems thicker than the others. Oily, I'd say. Is it? Probably because it comes from near the keg's bottom. Got more kick in it, I reckon. More kick was certainly correct, <coughs> Matthew thought. The third ale. That was the one that knocked me under, said Burton Gary in the office of the Herald Agency at number seven Stone Street several days ago. A few sips of it, and the next thing I knew, I was waking up laid out in the woods with the dawn light coming up, my money bag and pocket watch stolen, my boots and my waistcoat stripped from me, and my horse nowhere in sight. Needless to say, the Traveler's Rest Tavern was nowhere to be seen either. How far they took me before I was dumped, I can't say, but I suppose I'm quite fortunate they didn't brain me at the, on the spot. I had agree, said Matthew, who was alone for a few days, since Catherine Harold had gone to England, and Hudson Greathouse was all trying to recover Lady Edith Parkman's stolen prize Doberman. Uh, I'm sorry, Dal Dalmatian. <laughs> reel it back, reel it back. <laughs> Dalmatian. <laughs> I have some experience with dangerous tavern keepers, he went on. 
You might consider yourself lucky indeed that this group of robbers aren't necessarily killers. The sandy-haired visitor to number seven was about 40 years old, a medium build, had a rather sad-eyed face, understandable due to the circumstances, and an air of both pent-up anger and righteous frustration. When I got myself up off the ground and the world stopped spinning, he said, I walked six miles before I found a seat on a passing hay wagon. I slept in a barn that night, and at daylight walked another four miles, and I reached a tavern where they expected a coach bound for New York. Of course, I had not a shilling to my name, so what was I to do? What did you do? I begged, Gary admitted, and I promised that my friend in New York, Silas Jansen, would pay twice the fare. Silas happens to be a money lender, said Matthew. Yes, I know the man. Well, Gary continued, my coachman, the coachman agreed to three times the fare, and I was given the ride. <clears throat> Silas paid and also graciously afforded me the suit I'm wearing. As I told you, I own two boot making shops in Philadelphia, and I'm planning to open another here. But Mr. Corbett, those scoundrels should not get away with this affront. They even stole not only my new horse, but a fine silver button waistcoat from Paris. It was a birthday gift from my wife. I suggest you see our High Constable Gordon, uh, Gardner Lillehorn to aid you in this matter. To this, Gary gave a rather frightening scowl. Silas and I went to see him first thing. He says he can do nothing, that he's heard a similar complaint a few weeks ago and it also concerned a drug of some kind and a third tankard of ale. He says there's no law out there where there's, those robbers thrive and he has more than enough work to trouble him here. Can you believe that? I certainly can, knowing him. But what can I do for you? You can at least get my horse back for me. My God, is there no justice to be found here? Matthew thought about it. How on earth was he to march into a robber's roost and demand the return of a victim's horse? No, impossible. And he was about to say the same when he paused. Hudson had said, don't accept anything until I get back. But here was really the first problem Matthew faced since being introduced into the agency. Was there a way to march in there and get the horse returned? No, impossible. But still, was there? It would certainly go a long way to secure his future with the agency. Of course, if he was killed, it would be a short trip. <laughs> but were these varlets killers? It seemed not. Perhaps that was just wishful thinking. Don't accept anything until I get back. And Hudson had added his favorite term of derision, <laughs> moonbeam. <laughs> <laughs> then came the three words that Matthew knew he should not utter, but perhaps his own inflamed sense of worth compelled him to say, I will try. Thus, on this October Eve, he sat nearly stupefied in the company of Honey Bell, Chansey, and the straw-hatted, stolen, waistcoated man who was likely the leader of this group, with a third drug tankard at hand and a borrowed bag of gold coins from Silas Jansen that Gary had arranged. And as a cold matter of fact at the moment, he very much doubted his dumb idea of both justice and wisdom. <laughs> Break up, Matthew, said Honey Bell, with a smile that edged toward a sneer. Oh, you're a handsome one, you are. I... I feel woozy, Matthew answered. Pardon me if I step out to get some air. And let the coal latch in your lungs? She put a hand on his arm and tightened it. Folks have died that way. Well, he felt sweaty. <laughs> let me just stand up. Oh, my head's swimming. He pulled loose with an effort and got to his feet. He noted also that the straw-headed gent stood up. It was evident he was not getting out the door. Let me just put my face against the window glass and cool off a bit. Oh, that'll do, I suppose. I'll hold on to you and keep you from stumbling. Come on then to the window with you. With the woman leached to him and the two men watching with hawk-like eyes, Matthew did stumble his way to the nearest window. He pressed his face against the glass with the cold night beyond. Cool, head clearing it away and drew a white handkerchief from a pocket to mop his forehead and cheeks. There you go, said Honey Bell, her voice lower now, but carrying a sharper edge. All right, Gary, back to the table. Let's finish that drink. Then you can have a nice long rest up in a soft bed. Lean on me. I'll help you home. <laughs> home was certainly where he wished to be. But in another moment, he was returned to that damn chair at that damn table with that damn third tankard awaiting his lips. And what was to be done with that? Matthew lifted the drink and brought it toward his mouth, paused again, 
In the candlelight of the ugly tavern, he saw Honey Bell's silver shaded eyes shining like demon lamps. Her tongue flicked out, tasting gold coins. Quite suddenly, Matthew no longer had to concern himself with a tincture of opium or whatever soporific drug had been added by Chansey to the third tanker. For the door was kicked open, wham! And the noise knocked Honey Bell right out of her chair. In from the night stalked a huge black guard figure, black tricorn pulled low, leather mask over it up her face, and black kerchief around the lower, and ebon cloak pulled around the shoulders, and in black gloved hands, a blunderbuss that looked as dangerous as a small cannon. Nobody move, the man growled. The voice sounded as, as rough as splintered wood and as mean as a constipated bear. <laughs> Just stay nice and still and nobody gets hurt. To this, Honey Bell gave a little garbled shriek. She was on her knees and she lifted trembling hands in a manner of surrender. What the hell is this, demanded Sir Straw Hat. This, came the reply, is where everybody empties their pockets and puts the money in here. He, he touched the black leather bag hanging from a thick shoulder. You, the blunderbuss turned upon Matthew. Cuff it up, boy. A robbery, Straw Hat sounded incredulous. You're robbing us? <laughs> That's the name of it, Twinkle. <laughs> Twinkle, oh yes, Matthew had seen the gleam of a silver tooth in Straw Hat's mouth. We don't have no money. From Chancey's beard came a voice that sounded as high as a frightened schoolboy's. Now that's not what I've been hearing, the blunderbuss being impartial aimed at Chancey. Me and my gang here, this was a real robber's roost. But you better start finding the loot real quick. I don't have no time to dawdle. Your gang? Straw Hat now also sounded a trifle terrified. What gang? The hammer fist, you asshole. <laughs> We're taking charge of all hereabouts. The loot, I said. Money and we burn this place to the ground. He's got money, Honey Bell pointed at Matthew. A bag of coins. Music to my ears. The man's boots pounded across the boards until the blunderbuss was under Matthew's chin. All right, rich boy, give it up. Listen, I, the blunderbuss's deadly barrel pushed against Matthew's nose. Without another word, the bag of gold coins was dropped into the open leather bag. I'll have those two fancy drawers, said the villain, who abruptly and roughly winched, rinsed the cravat with his ruby stick pin off Matthew's neck. It followed the other wealth into the bag. You can't come in here and rob us, Straw Hat said, showing a weak flame of courage. We'll fetch the law on you. Ha! The robber laughed, a terrible noise. Ain't no law but me and my gang of hammer claws round here. Matthew's eyes widened a bit. Hammer fists or hammer claws? The, the robber should at least remember the name of his own gang. <laughs> but it flew over the heads of everyone else, particularly when the robber shouted, Money now! And fired the blunderbuss, an ear-cracking explosion that blew the bar's cake apart and set streamers of ale flying through the air. There was a flash of crimson lining from within the cloak. And suddenly the robber was holding a cock pistol, which he chose to aim at Straw Hat. Straw Hat! God's mercy! cried the targeted scoundrel, who threw up one hand and with the other started digging coins out of his breeches. A little pouch of coins came out from between Honey Bell's breasts. Chancey reached under the bar. Careful there, you bearded toad, was the admonition. And he came up with a clay jug, the contents of which dingled like a chorus of little chimes. Out toward the coins to the bag, and then the robber said with obvious lip-smacking satisfaction, Nice horse out front and two more in that corral out back. I'm taking them all. Any objections? None was given. Hear me, said the robber, who rubbed his nose under the cloth with a pistol's barrel. I don't want to play dirty, but this is how it's going to be. You got yourself a reputation here. If you stay in this location, which me and my boys are now claiming, you can keep on doing what you will, but you're gonna be giving us half of what you get your paws on. And if we think you're selling us short, we'll skin you alive and burn you to ashes with this damn hole. So from now on, you're keeping a ledger of what you get, and it better be true, because we'll be watching you, and we'll be coming in here to get a drink or two, and you'll never know the if of it. He started backing toward the open doorway, fireplace smoke swirling in his wake. Think on that and you best better think kindly on it. Matthew had to speak up, though he felt like falling down. Please, sir, 
Don't take my horse. How do I get back? Shut up, came the reply like a saw blade on rusted iron. Go cry to your mama. He stopped in the doorway. Anybody comes out in the next 15 minutes, they get to tell the devil how they got shot through the brain pan. Then he gave a little bow. Good night, all, he said, and he was calm beyond the light. Silence reigned in the traveler's rest. Silence and more silence until Straw Hat cried out through a strained throat, we got to back up and get the hell out of here. <laughs> Honey Bell began to sob. And Matthew felt a little sorry for her, but not by much. What am I going to do? He asked the group. How am I going to get home? Honey Bell's sobbing became a sodden snarl. Who the hell cares? Get out of here, you damned, you damned pauper! Which at the moment, Matthew Corbett really was. They began rushing about like headless chickens. Has it been 15 minutes? Matthew asked, but no one answered. He drew in a long breath, pulled his own cloak about his shoulders, and left a wretched place with his wretched inhabitants scurrying about gathering up whatever they wished to take with them on their forthcoming voyage to China. Matthew walked along the road in the dark, the breeze cold in his face. Some night this has been, at least he'd been spared the third tanker. He walked on and on, trudging across the coach rutted dirt with a wild forest on both sides. He figured he'd made at least half a mile before he came across the robber who sat astride his own horse with the other animals tied behind an equine parade. One of them surely belonged to Burton Gary, so that was that. How'd I do, Hudson asked, grinning now that they, the mask and kerchief cloth were removed. You need to work on your command of English, Matthew said, though I presume you were speaking their language. And I thought when I signaled you through the window that I had the third tanker that you weren't coming in just to spite me. Also, why did you make me walk half a mile to get to you? <laughs> I should have made you walk two miles, doing exactly what I said you should not do while I was gone. Damn it, Matthew, that could have been a real mess. But it was not, said Matthew as he swung himself up on the Subi saddle. Was it? Hudson had finished his work for Lady Parkman, had delivered the ransom and returned to Dalmatian unharmed. On his way into the office, he'd ask, who was that sad-eyed gent I passed on the stairs? And so. On the ride back under a starry sky and a yellow half-moon, Hudson said, well, I suppose you did the right thing. I mean, asking me to help. I won't hold it against you. I'm glad to hear it. I haven't asked in all our planning, but I also suppose that whoever stole Lady Parkman's dog has been sent to justice. Justice, Hudson repeated. And he was quiet for a while. Then... I followed him to a farmhouse after he picked up the money bag. I burst through the door, planning to break his arms. Inside, I found a young man, a young wife, and two small children, and poverty there as well. Seems the young man used to work for Lady Parkman until she fired him for bringing his children to play with the dog one afternoon. Said she didn't want their dirty hands on him. To Hudson's subsequent silence, Matthew ventured, You let him keep the ransom money, didn't you? I told Lady Parkman I lost him in the dark. She said she wouldn't pay me one shilling for work I did not complete. Hmm, Matthew said. I didn't realize you were the sentimental type. Last page, last page. <laughs> oh my gosh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I may have to do this from memory. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Well, yes. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Saved. <laughs> and the world rejoices. <laughs> Thanks, world. <laughs> hmm, Matthew said, I didn't realize you were the sentimental type. I'm not. And if you say anything about this to Catherine, I'll make a moonbeam see stars for a solid week. <laughs> anyway, Hudson said, and he made the leather bag jingle and jangle, musical with its booty. I think we made out tonight like robbers, don't you? <laughs> well said, Matthew replied. Very well said. They both have to, had to laugh in the quiet night. And their laughter followed them all the way home. Thank you. memory <laughs> so, uh, whoa oh
told me, you know, one time I was, uh, it's happened tw twice to me. I was reading a short story. The short story is called Strange Candy. It was published on my website. And that story was so emotional to me. I've tried to read the story twice. Um, I could not finish the story. It's about, a, it's a Halloween, about a, a man whose child gets a, a, a skeleton hand candy and he eats the candy and then he's visited by three ghosts who ask him to do favors for them during the night. And I got so emotional, I could not finish the story twice. I had to ask somebody from the audience to come up and <laughs> it was awful. I mean, you know, really, it's like a panic thing. Like, I can't finish the story, I get choked up. But anyway, anyway, I did not get choked up, but I did almost lose page. But you know, <laughs> there we go. But we did finish the story. This is, that, that's a good thing. So, um, all right, so that story is Robert's Roost, Robert's Roost, not Robert's Roost, almost, that I, that I did. Uh, and again, you know, it's like, I sit down to do these things and I think, I call myself a rocker, but it's almost like I am just kind of like, you know, hearing, I'm, I'm a conveyor of this information. So I can, I'm, it's like it really happened, you know? To me, it's like it really happened. It's like this, these are real people in this, in this real world, and this is really happening. And this probably actually really did happen at some point, you know, in, in, the, in America's history. Any questions? Please, please give me some questions because I, I really would like some. <laughs> yes, yes. You touched on it, but so when you're sitting down to write, you know, you do such a great job reading and, and conveying characters and stuff. Do you hear those voices? I do. I, I certainly do. Yes, I do. It, with those accents? I and, do. I okay. do. I certainly hear those. And, uh, and so uh, that helps me reading because I'm able to, I think, use what I hear. You know, of course, I can't do the, the women's voices correctly. Sure. <laughs> but, sure. but, you know, I, I, I do use what I hear. I do use what I hear. Yeah. As a follow up, do you dictate at all? Or no, do no, you, I don't. I don't. It's all, all it's, on, yeah. yeah it's no, all no. written. Okay. No, it's all written. All, all written. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Thanks for the question. Yes. When the Corbett series, Corbett series ends. I like that, Corbett. <laughs> <laughs> that's his French relative. Yes. When it ends, is there going to be a sequel? Yes. Yeah. 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 Be highly emotional, been reading it the entire time. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it. So they become part of our family. Oh, yeah. yeah. When it ends, do you, please tell me you're not retiring or do you have Oh, no, I'm not retiring. Do you have something on the horizon? Or? As I told this gentleman over here several years ago, I was going to retire when I reached 70. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen because I do have some, you know, it's, it makes that work. So you think, well, you know, uh, I have this idea and maybe I'll do this and then I have another idea and it's like, I, I think this will work. And but they're all going to be very different from the Matthew Corbett series, you know. But uh, but there'll all be challenges, which I love the challenge. Also, I was going to tell you, uh, if you don't already know this, I don't work with an outline at all. You know, I think I've I've, I've mentioned that. I just work, you know. I just start. You know, I, I kind of have a scene at the beginning, scene in the middle, scene toward the end. I know I'm kind of moving toward, you know, moving toward. But I, I you know, I've talked to other writers who, who are swear by an outline of every chapter of every, you know, everything. And that to me is just boring. I mean, it's just, I don't think I've ever tried to do a, a book I outline. I, you know, I've got so bored with it, I didn't finish it. So I just, because I'd already read it. You know, the, the books are for me, first of all. They're really for me, because I really don't know exactly what's going to happen. I know kind of what's, I, I didn't really know what's going to happen here, you know, in this story. So, so it's fun for me because <coughs> I don't really know what's going to happen, and it's a great challenge for me, Right? But I, but I always, but at this point now in my career, I know I'm going to be able to figure it out. And that is what I really enjoy. If you've got a challenge, it's like, what are you going to do here? You've got a problem here, you've got to figure it, you've got to solve it. I love that because that's, that's you know, part of what I enjoy doing. Yeah. Do you think Matthew's story will ever make it to the big screen? I do think so. All right. <laughs> in fact, in fact uh, they already tried it with uh, Nightbird. Okay. And and uh, they, they, I'm sorry, but oh, this is filmed, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, ouch! <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I really did not like the screenplay, and and it's like you know, you the story is not about Rachel. Rachel is the beginning of the story. The story goes on and on. The story has the story arc with Professor Phil, and it's a story arc. So you really can't do anything until I have finished the series. When I finish the series, then I think that I think we'll, we'll we'll move forward on that. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. I've been, okay. I've been, I've been thinking how to properly ask this question because it's probably a little bit of a mouthful. So, 
So, of course, with novels, everyone has their favorite novel by a certain person or, right. oh, a certain quote stands out in each novel, oh. each series. And with movies, you see a movie and then you're like, oh, my gosh, this cinematic picture, this is my favorite part of the movie, things right. like that. Right. Relating to your novel, Swan Song. Yeah. If you had a painting of your novel, a certain piece, certain phrase, or a certain moment in the novel that is your favorite part, to have it painted on an old painting, what it, would it be? There was already one like that. Really? Uh, the, the Dark Harvest did a, a limited edition. Dark Harvest is a Chicago publisher. I forget that year. But they did a special edition, and they on the cover, they did... Um, it was like a, a, a picture of the sequence where uh, a Swan offers the apple to the dark figure. Mm -hmm. right? So, so it's that kind of painting because I think that's my favorite part of the book, oh, where awesome. she offers and almost gets the dark figure mm -hmm. to take the apple, but then that would almost destroy the world because you got you know you can't do that. But but in a way, he wants to take this creature wants to take the apple. He want, wants redemption, but can't have it. Can't get there. You know, you just can't can't do that. So anyway, that and the cool thing about it is that the author in my it, at that time, the author put a picture of me in the crowd. In the oh, crowd. Cool. So a picture of me in the crowd. Is there another one, another thing that you? <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. No, I was going to say about sure art that reflects. That wasn't good enough. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, like, I, I guess I just like to know different views because you know whenever you see different artwork towards the story, is there something like, oh, I wish this would have been incorporated or this? Oh, in the, art, in the artwork. In artwork relating to your novel. Well, well, let me just say that I really, really like the, the, this whole premise of, of doing the covers like this. That's a pretty good picture. <laughs> 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 no, <laughs> but you know, it, it, so the idea that the book is like one color, but but using different colors for the figures down here of the sh different shades of the same color, I think that's a wonderful thing. But as far as you're asking, the idea that that I, 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 you're asking, I suppose that is there something that in the cover should be incorporated in? Well, all right, all right. The first one song that. Was it pocket books? The pocket books? Mm -hmm. yeah. Avon, pocket books. Avon or pocket books? Pocket. 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 The first, <laughs> this is also film. <laughs> <laughs> the first cover was, I thought, horrible. It was a garish clown looking face, you know, like yellow or orange or whatever. Yeah, whatever, whatever, it. whatever it was, horrible. You know, some people ain't like that, it's fine. But, but yeah, I suggested something else. And said, so, oh, we hate that. But, but now the cover, the, the newest cover with the kind of bleak looking landscape was my idea, you know. Uh -huh. But it's funny that <clears throat> I had a series of, of books that were garish covers, you know, horrible. I thought horrible. And I'm, when I met the uh, when I met the art director there, like he had on a bright yellow shirt, you know, a pink coat, you know, and purple pants, like, okay, that was just that. You know, the guy's color, color problem, you know. But, um, but I guess, uh, uh, you know, I was very disappointed in that first cover with the Swan Song, but then later it worked out that this is really the cover. It was more of a restrained cover. Yeah. It was more of a serious cover. Because the first cover made it look pretty, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The first cover made it look pretty silly, stupid, I thought. So, so they corrected themselves. But I think that's probably the closest I could, I could come to answering that. Yeah. Um, when you write and you know, you've got all these different characters in a story, you said you don't use outlines. Right. The story just sort of moves along. Yes. But do any of your characters surprise you? Like do something? That oh, always. They always do. That's what. Information to convey your point. Because they were. And, and that's like a cliche. You hear other writers say that. And, and it used to be I hear a writer say that. I think, oh, that's ridiculous. But it really is true. That you become attuned to your characters. And they attune in a way to you, and they will they will surprise you, which is a great. <laughs> the whole thing is like a mystic thing. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I mean, you sit down, because you sit down and you start. You start. You start. You start with that. You start with that. Well, it can be scary. You know, you start with that, it can be scary, but you know you you have your idea, and, and sometimes, I mean, in the past, I've thought, 
I've looked back at some of the books I've done, like Black like Swan Song, Little Boy's Life, some of the others, and I thought, if I had to do those again, I, I could never do those because it's the it's the it's the never never being able to step in the same river twice thing. You're just not the same person anymore. You've moved on. You, mm -hmm. you're, you've, you've learned more. You whatever, whatever. And I, you know, I'm, I'm very pleased with those books how they turned out. But somebody said, "Well, would you ever want to do a sequel to Boys Life or Swan Song, whatever?" No, no, because I couldn't. I couldn't. And I've always thought sequels, in, though, in a way. It's the Matthew Corbett. They're not really sequels. They're kind of, it's they're the same kind of story. different, different. It's same, but they're different, different stories. But I've never really thought that I wanted to do a sequel. You know, so um, I guess the closest I ever did to a sequel was the uh, was for um, Wolf's Hour. Yeah. Was for Wolf's Hour, The Hunter from the Woods. Right, right, right. So yeah, that, yeah. Short stories. Every word has to basically move the story. Right. Novels, you can kind of wander a little bit. Oh yes. Back. What's easier for you and does a short story turn into a novel now that you said you don't work with an outline, you go forward? <coughs> yeah, so you, does a short story turn into a novel? Well, you, usually a, for me, a short story will remain a short story because it will be like, okay, I know I know how this is going to begin, I know how it's going to end, and and usually I will write a short story thinking, I'm, uh, uh, if I was going to read this to an audience, uh, keep it going, keep it going, you know, and, and whereas you're right with a novel, you know, you can take your time, you can you can spend a lot of time reading it and enjoying it, but where the short story is concerned, I want to get in and out fairly quickly. Though, though I would say that there's a story in this book, A Wandering Mary, that's pretty, it's it's really not a short story, it's like a short novella, kind of between between novel and short story, so so that's kind of a different different animal altogether, but, but mostly when I start on a short story, it's going gonna, it's gonna to remain a short story. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As part of your research, have you ever participated in any, any historical reenactments or living well, history? Well, uh, yeah, in, in Williamsburg. You know, I go to Williamsburg to do my research, and I'm in there the first time I'm doing Nightbird, and I'm in there, you know, and I'm doing my research in this, you know, the election, and they have this vault room where they have all these diaries of the people who, you know. And so I'm in there, and I look around, and all the, all the people around me are in, in the costumes. You know, it's like we're all, everybody in there is in costumes, and I thought, this is just great. Because I love Williamsburg. Because you go to Williamsburg, you just get that feeling, and it's like, you know, you're there, and and it really helps me to go to Williamsburg. Used to be, used to be, um, when I did my first books, I had to do a, a list of if I had questions about my research, I had to do the list of questions and go to the library, right? And then I had, to, and sometimes I could not find what I was looking for at the library. Now with the internet, it's a double-edged sword because the internet's where I've taken readers away from. From the reading experience, mm -hmm. but the double-edged sword is that what's taken readers away from the experience is made research so much. Oh my God, really? Come on, you can find out anything, but you know you have to double-check your sources if you're really, really going to be accurate. You know, but but uh, anyway, uh, the internet's really made research a lot easier. Though it is again, it has robbed a lot of readers, taken a lot of readers from the reading experience. I hope that answered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in reading your, your books, there are a couple of minor details that kind of jumped out. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Here we go. laughs> this is the lighted fuse to the dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> there were a couple of wines, the Chateau Cam and the Amarone that you mentioned, and um, uh, Professor Fell, that put me in mind of Thomas Harris books, the Hannibal books. Okay. I was just wondering if that was okay. at all delivered. Or no, no, I, I, I haven't, I haven't read those. I'm no, no. So you know, it's an amazing thing. Um, yeah, it, but it, it's great. You know, I really like that people see things in my work that that I didn't put in there. I mean, I didn't, I didn't. Um, they see things in my work that I didn't think. Well, I'm putting that in there. I'm, I'm stressed at putting that in there. You know, I did a, a book called um, Usher's Passing, and and somebody wrote this long thing for the, for their graduate study about all the references to Edgar Allan Poe's work in there. I have no idea. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I heard about this and I saw the thesis. It was like, I, I did not know this. I did not know. Is it subconscious? I think it probably is. I guess it is. It, because it comes from all your reading. It comes from all your experience. It comes from everything that you are and that you that you experience, you know. So, so maybe it gets in there without knowing it, without knowing it. That essay's on the website, too. So. Pardon? That essay's on the website. Oh, it's on the website? It's, it's an essay. The right, essay. Passing. Okay. Cool. <laughs> it's scary to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. Yeah. Um, at 
what point when you were writing Nightbird did you realize Matthew Corbett is somebody that I was going to have more stories to tell about? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a good question. Oh, man. Well, the editor I took that book to, <laughs> I don't know if you know this story, the editor I took that book to said, you know, uh, Matthew and Rachel should fall in love the minute they meet. He should, he should marry Rachel and stay in that town and take care of her. <laughs> and I said, they're not going to fall in love the minute they meet because she's been living three, three months. She's been bathing three months in a buggy. It's not going to happen. You know? but, but she, it's funny though, there's some editors, mm, again, we're on that. <laughs> and this person's still working. Some editors think, you know what? I know what's best. And, and in the first of my career, I believed that. Mm. I did. I believe. I, I said, you know what? I'm a little guy from Birmingham, Alabama. What do I know? I want to be a writer. I'm trying to be a writer. I'm trying to do the best I can do. But I'm going up to talk to people in New York City who have a lot more experience than I do, and they're powerful people at these at these publishing houses, and they know what a good book is. Mm. And it took me a while to get over that. <laughs> mm. It took me a while to realize. I know what's best for me. I know what's best for my characters. And nobody, no matter how much power they have, or how much or how little money they're offering, is going to make me think somebody knows more, better for me with my work than I do. So so she wanted the series to it, not, not be a series. She was going to say, okay, it ends right here. And I said, no, we're not. And I didn't, I didn't sign the deal with that. It was at Viking Press. So it took me a while. It took me a while to be a big boy. It took me a while. Yeah. Yes. Um, boy's Life is my favorite book. <laughs> but um, because I feel like that's my childhood. Yeah. Except for the murder. Except for the murder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> so my question is, you just got through saying your books write themselves, but was the murder part of that storyline originally? Did it come in and then you put the magical part in between? Or did you start with the magical oh, part and put the murder at the this beginning? Is all, well, I needed something to drive the narrative over and above the young boy wanting to be a writer. It's need to drive the narrative. It, it, it's the same with the Matthew. There needed art, something to drive the narrative. But it started out as a basically a, a murder mystery in a small town. And I decided, I don't like this. It's boring to me, just that. So we're going to do something I've wanted to do for many years, which is do this this thing about the boy wanting to be a writer. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure I've told this. Was that your childhood? That, that idyllic life? It was, I think it was what I, it was not mine. It, it, it was what I wished my childhood to be. Uh, okay. It was a dream childhood, and maybe it is for a lot of people. But so I, so I, I decided not to do the murder mystery, and I, I did Boy's Life and turned it in. And I, I'm sure I've told you to everybody this before, but I thought, man, I'm proud of this. And I sent it into the publisher, and they're going to call me, and they're going to say, Rick, you, we didn't know you had this in you to do this book, right? So I get the phone call, and the phone call is, you know, we really don't know what to make of this book because it's not what your fans will like. It's not what your fans expect. We want you to go back to the, uh, the previous <coughs> book that you had planned. And that is one reason that I said when I said, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. You know, and you're wrong. I'm not doing it. So I was up to in New York, uh, like two days later, and I said, I'm not. If I, have, I was under contract, so I, if I had to break the contract, I'm going to break the contract because I'm not. I'm not going back. I'm doing this book is what I want to do. And that was a lesson for me, though, because it was like, okay, they they may they may not like that you're saying no to them. They don't like that, but you got to be true to yourself. Mm -hmm. And that was that was a big step for me. Big step for me. So. So anyway, but the murder, the murder kind of drove the story, kept the story kind of rolling, rolling, you know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You said you've been to Williamsburg. Yeah. Have you been to the American Village in Montevallo? I have, I have. Very, very nice there. Very nice there. That's great. I, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll get some more funding and do more there. That'll be great. That's a beautiful place. I, I love that area. But I, 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 I don't know if there's a, is there a restaurant there or not? Or I don't a restaurant. Is there a restaurant or tavern there? Close to it, yeah. Okay. It's on Main Street Tavern, not on that particular property. Okay. Close to it. Close to it. Well, 
that, that's a great opportunity to do something really cool out there. I think they just need some more funding, you know. Yeah, it's, it's cool out there. Are, are you with the, are you with the crew? Yes, sir. Cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's very great. Well, it so so you have you have future plans for to build to build or what's going yes, on? Yes, we're in the middle of building um, actually our the version of Independence Hall there. Right oh great! Now. I don't know when the last time was that you were there. Oh, it's, so. it's been a couple of years. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're expanding. We're, we're getting. Some okay, money. good. I'm glad. That's so great out there. It's a beautiful place. You know, yeah. The buildings are beautiful. They really are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a book collector, and I know there's a few of us in here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> do you get any special? Feeling, or is this something when you go to Lavidian? Well, this is a little bit different, but like Lavidian did uh, Gone South, like right. a specialty edition. Yes. You know, Dark Harvest, you mentioned, right. and right. Press has done some. Right. I don't I think that's the ones I'm aware of. Right. Do you get any special uh, feeling about selling those, or is that just well, all done by your, by your people? You, you know, sometimes I think, boy, these are way too expensive. Yeah. You know, I really take, do. Take it, it's taking it away from the, everyone. Yeah, I, I think it's way too expensive. Mm -hmm. But but I am very pleased that, that the work is put into these books to make them look so nice. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful books. Yes. Uh, okay, we're on the camera. When I'm saying mainstream publisher doesn't, doesn't care about making them look nice. Sure. Right. They don't care about making them look nice. They don't care about the longevity of a book either. We, about, we get, yeah, you know, you know we, that. We get excited about, yeah. you know, how they're bound. What absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely. And they still have 30 minutes. Uh, there you go. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> so, so it does. I, I think sometimes it's very expensive, you know. But then again, I, I want to support the publisher. The, the publisher has to be supported, you know. Yeah. And and the books have to sell, or or I can't write anything else. You know, I can't keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So, so it's again, it's a mixed mixed emotion in a way. Okay. Yeah. Thank yes. You. Okay, I love all your works. Go on, Thank don't you. get me wrong. Um, I, uh oh, this sounds oh, no. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. That's a good thing. But, but. Okay, no, I. Swan Song's my absolutely favorite, but when I read Nightbird, I mean, Night Song. Uh, yeah, Speaks yes, the Night. Yeah. Speaks the Nightbird. Right. I felt immersed. I okay. felt like I was there with them. Good. And maybe not good. so much with the others. Right. What? What? Is there something, do you know if there was something that changed with that series? Because uh, the well, writing has grown and, and I, uh, just... Uh, it was a period of time where I felt like I needed to do something really, really different. And, you know, I was sort of, what am I going to do that's different, really different? You know, that's not being, been done already before. So I decided to do that and I decided to really immerse myself in it immerse myself in the atmosphere. I did a lot of research. And it was like, is this going to be a short book? No. Don't worry about the length. Just keep going. And don't worry about, you know, just do the atmosphere. And, and I think that first chapter, the first sequence there, is if, if, you, if you like that atmosphere, you're really in there. If you don't like it, it's like, oh my God, I have time for this, you know. But, but, but if you like that, that's what I wanted. I wanted atmosphere, right? So the, 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 the latter Matthew books, um, have become more adventure sequences, adventure mm -hmm. series, I suppose. And I don't dwell on, I dwell on the atmosphere too, but I don't think, well, I, I have, you know, even though the books are long, as you would say, they're, they're too long. You know? <laughs> I don't think they're too long. They're, too long. I, well, get on they're my friends. Their characters are my friends. So. He, says, he says they're too long. He says, they're breaking down my show. So anyway. <laughs> so they are long, but, but in, in a way, I, when I did Nightbird, it's like, this is going to be a long book because I'm going to make a statement. And I, did, I didn't, feel, I didn't yeah. feel like I had to make a statement with the others because they just carry themselves. Right. But I felt like for Nightbird, I need to make a statement that I can do this mm -hmm. and I can, I can pull people into that atmosphere. So, yeah. I can feel the mosquitoes biting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I could too, I could too. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Uh, well, two things on the collectible books. When, when Subpress came out with the new Swan Song, <laughs> yeah. years back, my wife and I were in Seattle, and when I saw the email, I stopped on the street and ordered it. Oh, you did? Even though it was expensive. Yeah, it was expensive. And it sold that in 30 minutes. Yeah, it did sell So, so I mean, I, even though it was expensive, fans yeah. to have that on their shelf. Well, see, that's that's amazing the, to me. And I'm not sorry. Well, the, the second was on Speaks the Night. When it came out, re reading the cover, of course, I bought it immediately. I mean, the signed copy through here, I think, at the time. 
it was so far off from what I loved in your traditional writing. It sat on my shelf for three or four years. Wow. Before I thought I need to read that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I what did it come out of one I think. Yeah. And I read it and I thought, this is fabulous. Oh, good. I mean, it was it was different. I mean, kind of a different genre. But it was fabulous. Good. I'm glad. I appreciate that. Well, um, uh, to elaborate on your question about the Matthew series, I do have some things working, and uh, one was pretty close to being the starting film uh, until the strikes, the double strikes, the uh, two strikes, first in 60 something years. Like, Is it me? Is it me? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, it's pretty close to. They were, they were about to start filming in Atlanta uh, when, when the strike hit. So I think once the actor strikes over, we'll get that started. And more than that, I really can't talk about it. But I have some other things working. And a friend of mine said, you know what? Uh, you're 71. Uh, it's strange that these things are starting to happen now that in your, in your elder age. And I think, you know what? I like that. I like that. Because I have been through so much in my career, ups and downs. I have fought people. I have, I mean, I've really been around I've been around the track, I mean, really, many, many times. So it's almost like, you know, you as a kid, you wait for Christmas, and Christmas never comes, and you think, when is Christmas coming? <laughs> and finally, it's Christmas is here, and you get to open your Christmas presents. My Christmas is here. My Christmas has come. And, and I'm very excited about the future. It's like I, I've been through all that, and I can look back on that as a, as a testing period of my life, and a period that, that honed my ability as a writer, and I can say, you know what? I got a big Christmas coming. Big Christmas coming. Well said. Mm -hmm. All right, yes, sir. Good time. All right, Robert McCann. <laughs> so it's uh, time for the drawings. Now, you didn't know there were drawings, but they're going to be drawings. Oh, <laughs> drawings. The first one, of course, is for all the people in the world. <laughs> including those of you here today, somebody is going to get this magic walking stick and we'll tell you about the other two drawings in just a moment. But the person who wins the Robert McCammon walking stick is... Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> right into that, huh? The person who wins this is... <laughs> um, why does this have that on there? The nest, why does it have that on there? Do you know that? Yeah, it has nothing. Okay. <laughs> the person who wins that is Robert McCammon. No, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is Robert Williams. Oh. Is it Robert Williams? Robert Williams, Williams. Williams. Robert Williams here? <laughs> this will be mailed to Robert Williams yeah, Robert wherever Williams. he is. Robert Williams. Robert Williams. Robert, we'll put this All right. And now, the drawings that nobody knew about, there are two drawings. One drawing, and, and both of these drawings are just for you. <laughs> this is a special group of names, just of you who are here today. There are two drawings. One person will walk away with this great poster of Robert McCammon's oh, cool. new book that he has agreed to sign and personalize. Right. <laughs> but we're having another drawing right now, and Mr. McCammon will tell you about this drawing. I'm giving the story away. And then we'll all hit it all the way on. What about the right? I'm going to So it'll all be in order. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, we're giving that away. And uh, this story will, will not be published anywhere. It is uh, it is a one of a kind. Wow. And whoever gets it just has a, a Matthew story. And I'm going to inscribe this and sign it, you know, and we'll all be good. Okay. And the person who's walking away with the only copy, talk about an exclusive copy. And that person is. That person is. 
Oh. That person is Guy Pearson. And we'll bring it down inside. <laughs> and for the other drawing also, we'll bring this down and personalize it to Guy when you're in line. And whoever wins this also, if you'll keep your seat, Mr. McCammon will personalize this to you. And just like those of you who've been to weddings, funerals, and bar mitzvahs, please keep your seat after this drawing and allow Mr. McCammon to get down to the signing table, and then you're all welcome. And the winner of the poster is... With great artwork by Vincent Chong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And the winner of the poster is Bill Fraun. Bill Fraun, he just called. Bill Fraun, he just called. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> He's not here. He's not He's here. He's not here. Well, <laughs> Look at him over here. Look at him over here. Look at <laughs> Don't draw his wife's name, but she's in here also. Uh -oh. <laughs> is that, is that, is that her Swiss name in there? <laughs> oh, Why is he crying and crying? Um, Willa Dean. Oh, no! no! If you'll allow us to, uh, let's put it down. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. We'll be down at the uh, signing table yes, 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 for those yes, of you who yes, did yes, not yes, win yes, anything. Yes, yes, yes. Just get the yes. Yeah, all right, guys, before, before, before we do this, guys, thank you for being here. Really, thank you. Thank you.